My name is Morten. I'm from Norway. I've um, come here today to talk to you uh, about two of my passions, uh, technology and, and football. So I work as a consultant, a programmer, really. And as you might have guessed, I'm also a football referee. Uh, that's a hobby of mine. <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about a pet project I did uh, roughly one year ago. Uh, I decided to create uh, an, a web application that simplifies the life um, of a group of people that many believe were bullied as children. Uh, they're suffering from some sort of self-loading, uh, which means that they subject themselves to, to these self-harming activities. Uh, and I'm talking about football referees, of course. I created an app. It took me like five or six uh, week, uh, weeknights. Um, it's visited about... 150 people, unique users every day, and 350 unique uh, users per week. So I'm not, I'm not Amazon or Google, but uh, I think it's fairly okay for a, for a pet project. So technologies and referees. Um, the football community is often seen as, as quite, quite conservative when it comes to using technologies. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have technology already today. In fact, we have, we have the flags. Um, and I'm not talking about the visual aid, <laughs> which, which of course can be considered technology as well. But in fact, these flags have an integrated pager system. So you can click a button on the flag, and the referee will have a pager on his upper arm, and it will vibrate once the assistant clicks the button. So that's a good way for the assistant to, to get the referee's attention if he's not able to get it by waving the flag. The last few years, we've also seen introduction of the communication system, so not, uh, not quite, quite similar to, to the one I'm wearing now. Um, how this works is that the referee, when, whatever the referee says during the match, uh, is broadcasted to the assistant referees, the fourth official, and even the, the, the additional assistants uh, in, in the UEFA Champions League. So everything is said, and that also means that everything that the players are saying will also be catched by the... Or caught by the, by the microphone. And the other uh, referees can talk back by pushing a button and they can transmit back. So they can, they'll be able to communicate within the refereeing team. And finally, we'll see the introduction finally of, of goal line technology. Now in the UK, the Premier League for the next season, uh, goal line technology will be installed for all, all, uh, all teams in the Premier League. So finally, we'll, we'll be able to get rid of those uh, goals being allowed or disallowed, which really shouldn't. So how many of you have been wondering what goes on in the head of a referee during a match? What are, what are the referees telling the players during a match? And for those of you who came here today, uh, I will give you a little treat. You'll get some insight into what referees are saying and thinking during a game. Um, I'm going to be showing you a s video clip. This is from the Euro 2008 finals. It's uh, a Swiss referee. His name is Massimo Buscaka. Um, and uh, he referees a match between Sweden and Greece. So let's have a look at how he does. Agonis! Agonis! Come at signal! Come at signal! Usa! Usa Chazzo! Dai, Caracunis! Come at signal! Ti do del giallo, cazzo! Lascia perdere! Wait then, yellow, yellow. Matthias, follow the venice. Try 100% clear, eh? 100%. Yeah, 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 Play, 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 play on. Change or not? Yes. <laughs> It's a big storm in the city. Patrick, huh? Patrick told me it's a big storm in the city, so maybe it will come here. I don't understand. What are you it's fucking uh, talking? It's raining in the city. Big rain. So maybe it will come here in a few moments, because now it's... Uh... It's not my problem. Shut up. Okay, but just to be prepared. Shh, shh. Because of your... No, concentrate, concentrate. Yeah. Ivan, please, please. 
Don't talk for nothing. Non facciamo cazzate alla fine. Okay, so a couple of things you'll, you'll notice there is, the first one is, is uh, how the technology helps the, the referee at the beginning of the clip. Uh, there is a situation where the, the assistant actually gives advice to the referee to, to show the yellow card. So that's great use of technology. Uh, the assistant might not be sure, uh, the referee might not be sure, but the assistant helps him out saying that this is a yellow card, and, and uh, finally the, the referee produces the yellow card. So great help for the, for the referee. And towards the end, we'll, we'll see how technology can be an annoyance. So you have the fourth official uh, giving updates on the latest weather reports. Now, we as referee, we control a lot of things when a match is going on, but we can't control the weather. There's nothing we can do to control the weather. It doesn't help to know that it's going to be raining in 15 minutes. It's not like we can stop the rain from coming. So while the referee is trying to concentrate, he keeps getting these weather reports. So obviously, very annoying. So technology can both be for us a great help and an, an annoyance. So <clears throat> back to Norway. Um, until 2009, uh, everything, all the communications with, between the, the football association and the referees was paper-based. So at the beginning of each season, you would get a, a list on paper uh, with all the matches you're going to referee, and you would get corrections sent by mail, so by snail mail, envelope, everything. Uh, during the season, until 2009, where the FA in, um, decided to introduce a web application. Um, they bought uh, a web application from, from some Swedes. Uh, we'll talk more about the Swedes later. Um, so, they were going paperless. Now, I wish that I could say that this icon is just rep uh, a poor representation of the, of the web. Uh, but in fact, I've chosen this icon because it represents all the browsers that this application was compatible for. So it was an IE application only. And this is what it looks like. There's some strange things going on here. Uh, you can see the heading is broken, and there's the tabs, there's the text is partly hidden. And this might be because I've taken this screenshot using uh, Chrome. And I just said that uh, this only works in IE, so how can that be? Well, it only really works as intended in IE, but you can navigate. If you view the source code and you copy the links and you paste them into the address bar, then you'll be able to use this application in Chrome as well. Um, other than that, I guess it's, it's not the most modern design, but I'm no great designer, so I shouldn't knock the other people's design. But I could sense a pet project here. Um, so this was an itch for me. I wanted to be able to view the matches I'm refereeing on my mobile phone, or in the Chrome browser on the Mac, or Chrome browser on Windows. Um, and the itch was fairly, fairly big. Um, and with pet projects, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, pet project is the way I, I tend to learn off the job. So on the job, you're, you're kind of restricted, but pet projects, you're free to do whatever technology you want to use. Uh, but pet projects tend to stop once you get to the point where um, you, you stumble upon some hurdles, and it doesn't really feel like you want to invest the time to get beyond those hurdles. But for me, this is a great age, so I, 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 I stumbled on and, and created this application. Now, the first thing I wanted to do uh, was to ask the Norwegian FA, of course, if it was possible to get a read-only access to the, to the database or, or get some sort of an API. Um, as you might have guessed, they, they said that that was not possible. So, but that didn't mean that uh, I couldn't get the data. It just meant that I had to get the data the way people were getting it with Internet Explorer, so through the web. So what I decided to do was to create what I call a man-in-the-middle architecture, uh, where my, my application sits between the, the original application and the referee. And I would uh, get the data from the original application and I would uh, provide it in an in a, in a HTML format that would be acceptable for all browsers. And I would also provide it in a calendar format so you would be able to subscribe to uh, a calendar feed getting all your matches automatically into your calendar. So that was my, my goal. And this is uh, the, the web page I ended up creating. 
So you, you log in here and you can get a view of all the matches you're uh, going to be refereeing. Uh, you can filter them on, on the, only the upcoming matches or also the played matches that you've been refereeing. Uh, you can see all the available matches, so matches where there's no referee assigned, so you can sign up and tell the FA that you're, you'll be interested in refereeing this match. And I have added an about page where I have some details of how I uh, do security. You can also see there's a donate button there, which is a very underutilized feature on this web app. Um, and I have the calendar feed, so you can... Uh, uh, Subscribe to the calendar in your in Google Calendar or your, on your iCal or iPhone. Even Outlook, I think, supports uh, calendar feeds now. So, I also done some responsive design, which means that if you minimize the window, uh, you'll get that menu button on the top, which you, I'm sure you've seen on many mobile websites. So that's that's what I uh, ended up creating. Um, the thing is that uh, I needed to get the data by doing the, the ancient discipline of screen scraping. And there was only a few things I knew for this pet project. I wanted to learn Scala. So I was going to be using Scala, and I knew that to integrate uh, with this original application, I needed to support login. Log uh, and login um, generally requires cookies, so I needed to do screen, uh, screen scraping framework that supported cookies. So I, that's what I did. It was I, I googled cookies, screen scraping, uh, there's a good tool in, in Chrome where you can do the inspect elements on, on a web page, and that will open another pane at the, at the bottom, and, and you can highlight different elements in, in the web view, and you will see the corresponding source code. So that's a really good way of, of, uh, of uh, kind of deciphering what's going on in the, in the application and figure out which elements you're going to be, to be screen scraping. So <clears throat> we'll have a look at the code, uh, how I did this. Um, so I'm using uh, JSUIT, which is a Java framework, uh, but it kind of feels like a Scala framework here. Before I continue on, how many people here are, have written one line of Scala code at least? Okay, so there's, there's a few. Uh, so this is my, my scraping method for scraping the matches that are assigned to a certain referee. Uh, the thing I do here is I do a connect to the, to the resource I'm going to be, be scraping. Uh, I provide, uh, I set the cookie, which is also sent in as an input param parameter in this method, so it, it, it kind of expects you to, to be logged in already. I specify the get method, and I set a fairly, fairly high timeout here of 25 seconds, and that's because the application I'm scraping is probably not the most responsive application in the world. I'm telling it not to follow redirects. Um, that's because I, I simply wasn't able to make this work without setting that to false. Uh, then I do an execute, and that will give me a response. Now, on this response, I can do a parse, and that will, in turn, give me the HTML document. And now I'll start uh, selecting data from that document using a selector syntax, which will look similar to, to the jQuery selector syntax for those who have, are familiar with jQuery. So this is basically the HTML I'm interested in. It's a div tag, and there's a table tag, and there's a table body, and there's the table rows. So the table rows or what contain the data I'm interested in, in, in scraping. So I'm using that selector syntax to find the div element uh, using the div and the ID of the element. Now this is um, the ID and the class, th this is Swedish. So again, this is the Swedish code. Um, and I'm going for the table with a, with a CSS class, and I'm going to the child element table body and the child element table row. So now I've uh, isolated all the table rows. I have, still have a document with, with the table rows uh, elements. Uh, and then I do a uh, list iterator, so I want to have this as an iterator. And I'm using, uh, this is a Java framework, but I want to use a Scala iterator. So I do S Scala, which will magically make this Scala. So I'm uh, in Scala land now, and that means I can use, call the, the drop method. The drop will do exactly what it sounds like. It will drop the uh, first number of, of rows, so I've specified one, and I'm dropping the first row. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the first row will be the table header, so I'm not interested in the header values. Okay. Um, for those not uh, familiar with, with the lambdas or, or, uh, or Scala at all, I'm now doing a map over that iterator. So I'm doing a map, and that's basically a transform. So for each element, I'll do a transformation. And I'll transform from uh, HTML to uh, a plain old Scala object, if you want. 
Um, so I'm just getting all the data from, the, from that table row, and I'm creating uh, a Scala object um, based on that assigned match class at the bottom here. Once that's done, the final thing I do is I do a tool list, because I don't want an iterator. I want something I can traverse several times. So I'm, so I'm transforming from an iterator to, to a list. OK, that was getting data. Now, uh, as you saw, there was an input parameter here that was the, the cookie value. So I need to, to actually get that cookie. And to do that, I need to log in. Um, and to do that, I need to do a post. Again, Chrome is a great help. This is the data being submitted whenever I do a login. There's a lot of data here. Uh, I was able to isolate these elements as the important part of the, of the payload. So one thing that you'll notice that is quite strange, if you ask me, is that um, once, when you do a login, you actually send a cookie value. So the session is created uh, on the logon page and not after you're logged in. So they create a session before you log in, which is strange. But that's how this web app works. Something else that's strange is the form data on the bottom here. There's two hidden fields being sent, the view state and event validation. I believe these are some, some fields used by, by, the, by the MVC framework they use in .NET. And they also sub, uh, I also need to submit the, the name of the button being clicked. Also very strange. I don't know why they did that, but if I, if I don't submit that, the login won't work. And finally, username and password, the only thing that really makes sense. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the, before I can do a login, I actually have to scrape the login page itself to get the hidden fields and to get the cookie being set. So I do that first. Once that's done, I can actually perform the real login. So I do a login. Uh, I submit all the form data I've already successfully scraped. I do a post, and I uh, set a cookie, and execute. And for the response, the only thing I'm, uh, I care about is the status code of, of the, the login request. So a 302, in this case, means that the login was successful. So they, that what, what they typically do is they, they, once you're logged in, they redirect you to the page that's for authenticated users. That's a 302. Uh, so if it's okay, I will return the cookie. So that means that the cookie I scraped is now uh, an authenticated session. So then I return the cookie. Anything else other than that, I'll return an error. So I've, I've proven that I can, I can get the data uh, from, from the original application, uh, but I need to present this some way. Um, and I decided to go with a framework in Scala called Unfiltered. Now, this is a really neat framework. Uh, I've written here that it's a web framework, but it's really more of a HTTP servicing framework. Um, it uses pretty much standard Scala, so there's not a lot of framework in there at all. Uh, some frameworks in Java, it's difficult to know where the framework begins and the language ends. Uh, here, it's pretty much just standard Scala practices and, and a couple of helper classes. And it's, that means there's very little um, specific framework code. Uh, in fact, this is me starting a web app with unfiltered with a banded jetty. So I think you can all figure out what's going on here. It's, it's not really magic. There's one thing that stands out, and that's the last line where I, where I supply something called the loss plan. And this is my code uh, injected that will handle all the HTTP requests. So let's have a look at the loss plan. In the plan, I need to implement a method called intent. And inside of that intent, I'll start doing pattern matching. So this is, this is uh, part of, of, of the great thing about Scala is doing pattern matching. So I will match on the request. And this is a very HTTP uh, servicing true framework. So it's really true to the HTTP protocol. So I will match on the request. I will match first on the method. So it's a get method. So a user is accessing this, and, and he's doing a get. And he's doing get on a resource. A, a URL, and a URL will consist of the server part, and after the server, there will be a path. And a path will consist of segments. So the segments is everything between the slashes. Uh, so I'm saying here that there will be a path with no segments. So that basically means root. So localhost 1337 in this example. If, that's, if the request matches that uh, pattern, then I'll, uh, I'll compose the response on the, on the right side. Uh, so you have the, the arrow or the rocket. 
And I'll, I'll do an OK. So that means HTTP 200. This is OK. And I'll, I'll respond with HTML. So the HTML5 response function here is setting the content type as text HTML. And it's actually also providing the HTML. So in Scala, XML is actually valid Scala code. If it's valid XML, it's valid Scala code. So you have support for XML literals. And of course, uh, if, you write, if you want, you can write HTML as valid XML. And that's what I'm doing here. So I'm just, if you go to that URL, the root, you will just get a heading saying loss of the game. You can do more advanced stuff as well. So if you go to the go to the localhost and slash loss slash 11, which I'm matching for on the second line, again it will be okay. And I will do HTML5, and I'm calling a method called offside here, which is law 11 uh, for those who are interested. Um, now here I'm, I've declared the list of a couple of dead ball situations where there can't be an offside. So from a goal kick, a corner kick, and a throw in, uh, you can never be uh, in in offside position. <clears throat> so for, first, I then I declare a header uh, and a table, and for then I map over the, the list of, of these situations. So I map, and so for every situ situation, I will create a table row. And this is a nice way of like programmatically uh, doing doing creating the code, uh, HTML code, and that will look something like this on um, once it's if, if you hit that URL. And finally, so <coughs> this might be a, look a, a bit cluttered with all the XML in here. Uh, I quite like it, but, but I tend to, to create my own, own uh, objects that hold all those XML, so I don't mix it into the, into the uh, plans like I've done here. Uh, so here I've, I've added a snippets, which is what I t tend to call this, this uh, component holding the XML. And so this is the snippet. I created so I do a for index. The first thing I do is I call another method, where I supply the the body of the of the page I'm I'm uh, going to be creating, and the empty page method is actually my in a way the template for me. So this is a very simple empty page, but in ge generally in, in my application, I've, in this empty page, I will include the CSS, I will cl include the common menu that will be on the top, and everything like that. So. Uh, for every page, I can just call this empty page with, a, with the content I want inside of the page, and the menu and everything will be generated with the same code all the time. So if you organize it like this, it will look quite nice. Now, <clears throat> in the UK, you have this term, uh, WAGs. WAGs is the wife and girlfriends of the professional footballers. Uh, these are uh, Victoria Beckham, and it's the typical page three models which footballers tend to marry. Uh, now, contrary to popular belief, even us football referees mate, we find partners. Uh, and we'll have a look at another clip from the partners of the Italian referees, uh, led by the Italian uh, head referee Roberto Rossetti. Um, and we'll have a look at their opinion on the game as they watch their husbands referee again from the 2008 European finals. Buonissimo. Che bella sta divisa azzurra comunque, più bella sì, di tutto. Ma anche altre volte è azzurra. Mm. Azzurra. So, <clears throat> what happens here is Roberto, he almost makes a wrong decision. He's, he's giving the, the throw in the wrong way. Uh, but it's, thankfully, it's being corrected by his assistant, so he finally ends up giving it the right way. Um, at home, though, the wives, they're watching the game, and, and they're really interested in the, the color of his kit. Uh, and I'm not saying this to, to ridicule the wives. I'm, I'm saying this to, to show that, that the refereeing community, we're quite vain. We're concerned about our appearance. Uh, strange that that might seem where I'm standing here in a software conference, like dressed like this with, with the socks going up to the knees and everything. Uh, but we're concerned about our appearance. And, and if you paid close attention, you would see that his whistle was blue matching his kit. And when I referee with this kit, I wear the 
yellow and black uh, whistle as well. So we're concerned about uh, appearances. So when I, wanted, when I created this web application, I, I cared about what, what the application would look like. And I uh, went with a front-end framework, which is Twitter Bootstrap. I'm sure many people here know Twitter Bootstrap by the raise of hands. So Twitter Bootstrap is a framework uh, that helps aesthetically challenge people like myself to create something that looks quite good. Um, it's a collection of CSS and jQuery plugins. Um, and it's very well documented on, uh, on, uh, let's see, on, uh, on GitHub. So you can, if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go and, and have a look at the GitHub page for Twitter Bootstrap, where you can see different kinds of uh, examples where they're showing you uh, code examples and a corresponding view what it will look like. So it's, uh, it's a nice, nice place to be inspired. And I, I've used this uh, and copied code from here uh, religiously throughout my development. Now, this has a great posi positive effect, uh, and I'll show you what I mean. This is me doing web design by myself. This is a web page I did in 2002 as part of um, a course in university. And this, of course, has all the important design elements you want to see in a modern web page. It has the, the red, red background color, which is very pleasing to die. It has the raised borders on the table, which gives it that modern look. Um, also, unfortunately, this is a, a screenshot, so you, what you won't see is that the GIFs on the top there, under, under my name, they're actually animated, so they're like turning around their own axis. So this is like classic web design. So this is me by myself, and with a little help, I'm able to create this. Now, there are some minuses uh, when using Twitter Bootstrap as well. And one of them is that I'm not, I'm not the only one who's aesthetically challenged. There's a lot of people like me. That means that when you use Twitter Bootstrap, your application will tend to look like a lot of other applications on the web. But I think we can all agree that given the choice between my unique design skills and looking like everyone else, uh, looking like everyone else is better. So there's time for another short clip. Um, this is a clip uh, from, uh, again, the Euro finals. It's a clip with, uh, from a match between Turkey and the Czech Republic. The head referee here is uh, Peter Fjordfeldt, who's a Swede. So I've been knocking the Swedes so far, but uh, I'm going to be giving them some credit here because uh, Peter is a really good referee. In fact, he was appointed the fourth official for the final in the Euro 2008, uh, where the head referee was, was the Italian we saw earlier. Now, this is a short clip. What I want you to pay attention to is, is the goalkeeper. What happens to the goalkeeper after the referee has blown his whistles? Just pay attention to the goalkeeper. So many people will think, think that this is what we referee lives, live for. Sending players off is like we're getting revenge for all the bullying in our childhood. Uh, but that's not true. In fact, whenever you send a player off, the temperature of the game will change you will have 10 remaining players who will disagree with everything you do for the remainder of the match. And no matter what happened, they will feel hard done by. So it's, it's not really a good feeling when you give the, re give the red card. Uh, having said that, if you're going to send someone off, this is the dream situation. This is uh, the goalkeeper is pushing the opponent, and that is considered violent conduct, so that's an easy sending off. So it's, it's, a, it's the easiest decision you'll ever make, sending someone off like that for the push. And that's a, ch a cheesy segue into the Heroku platform, which is also very easy. And it uses Git, so it uses the push uh, on Git for deployment. So it's Git-based, so when you do deployment with Heroku, you do a simple push to another remote repository. And there's very little adaptation required by your application. In fact, this is uh, the same uh, 
the same st um, starting my application with embedded jet the same way as I showed you earlier with one tiny difference and that's the way I resolve the port name I used to have this hard coded that's but now I'm I'm looking it up through the environment variables so Heroku will tell my application which port to bind to uh, by setting an environment variable and that's the only change you need to do to your application code so there's a lot of advantages with using Heroku, and uh, it's non-intrusive. In addition to that line of code, I also had to add three lines to my SPT build script. There's a lot of different uh, add-ons available. And this is really good for, for if you're doing a pet project, because um, you want to learn new stuff. And I wanted to learn new stuff, and I needed to store something in my application. So I, ah. Oh, MongoDB, I haven't tried that before, but I see there's a plugin here. So I went with MongoDB, and I've, I've learned MongoDB now. So it's really good to, to, to do pet projects. Uh, they have relational databases, NoSQL databases. They have log monitoring. They have uh, support for email sending, so all sorts of different add-ons. And most of them have a free plan, so you can use them for free, most of them, as long as you don't use them uh, excessively. excessively. It supports bring your own container, which means that you can bring, you can if you can uh, embed your container in, in your app, so you can bootstrap it like I did in, in, the, in the my app, then you can run it on Heroku. So that means like, you can use Jetty as I did, you can use Tomcat, and uh, if refereeing isn't enough to hurt yourself, you can probably use the big containers from the commercial vendors as well. It has SSL support. That means that all the endpoints that you can access by HTTP, you can also access over HTTPS. That's good for me because people will be logging in, so I don't want them to send, my, send me their username and password uh, unencrypted. So it's, it has uh, SSL support. It's polyglot in the way that it supports a lot of different program, programming languages. Uh, in addition to Scala and Java, of course, uh, it's at least support for Ruby. Uh, I think there's six or seven languages supported last time I checked. So um, probably more now. There's one big negative, at least for me, and that's this, this is running on, on Amazon, and it's running on uh, uh, service in the US East. And for me, this means uh, a couple of round trips. If you remember the login case, I needed to scrape the login page, then I need to perform the login, then I need to redirect the user. So that's three round trips just to perform the login. And latency starts to matter. Now, I used Guava in my application and to battle this latency, and I'll tell you why. Um, Guava is a framework uh, written by Google. It's, uh, it makes Java more modern in a way. It's, uh, it has better collections, so you have some sort of Im immutable collections, and has some, uh, some support for functional programming. Um, but Scala already has this. I'm using Scala, and Scala with far superior collections and, and support for functional programming. So I'm using Guava. And the reason I'm using Guava is because of this little uh, brilliant uh, code. And that's the Guava Cache Builder. So the Guava Cache Builder uh, is a, a cache that is in-memory cache. Uh, it supports uh, read-through caching. And it supports timed eviction. And I'll show you how it works. So this is uh, me using Guava in my Scala code, the Guava Cache Builder. So I'm declaring here at the, um, at the top uh, a value, so a, a member of, of the class, uh, the cache. And I'm building the cache using cache builder. So I'm doing a new cache builder, and I'm saying that this will expire after five minutes. So the longest uh, any element can reside in the cache is five minutes. And I won't accept more than 100 elements. And I'm, finally, I'm supplying uh, a method into the build. So this is me supplying a, 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 a function, passing in a function. And this is the function that Guava will use to get data if there's no hit in the cache. And that means that on, on use the, the method below, uh, the matches for, uh, I can, oh, I can uh, access the cache and get the, the matches. And the cache will automatically, if there's no hit in the cache, it will use the provided method and, uh, and scrape the, the, uh, the matches for me. So I can read all the, all the matches through the cache uh, every time. I don't need to, to call out the scraper explicitly. The, the Guava cache builder will do that for me. And that, again, enables me to create an application that, with the round trips back and forth, uh, will seem faster than the original. 
And the reason it will seem faster than the original is that I will predict what the user will do once it's logged in. So once it's logged in, I will do a lot of cache warming uh, activities. Um, once the user is logged in, I will start fetching all the matches the referee is going to be refereeing. I will fetch all the matches that is available to, to be refereeing. I'll fetch a lot of data. And I'll do this using the spawn method in, in, um, in Scala. This is a higher order function, so it takes another method. So in the spawn, I supply it with another method, and that's the, my call out to the, to the match cache. And that will uh, then fetch all the matches and, and put them in the cache. Spawn is a fire and forget, so it doesn't return anything. There's no return value from this method. But I have uh, access to the cache. So what I'm able to do here is to benefit from the side effect being done in the spawn method. So I will fire off a, 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 a synchronous action, so there will be a thread uh, running and, and fetching all the matches while the user is logged in. And that means that once the user is logged in, uh, it's likely that the cache is already filled. So once the user is logged in, you can click all over, click different menu, uh, menu items, and everything will just pop up. So that's a, that's a nice way to, to combat that problem with latency and, and make your app seem more, more responsive. Finally, I, I mentioned the calendar feeds. Um, I'll show you just shortly how I did this. Uh, so the calendar feeds, uh, what you do if you want to make a calendar feed in your application is that you have to have a public available URL. I'm generating that URL per user using a UID, so similar to what you will see in Google Drive. So it's a public URL, but it's not possible to guess. Um, and I, will, I, I create that URL, and if you do a get on that, you will get uh, a response where the response type is set to text calendar. So no, no longer text HTML, but text calendar. And I'm building that text according to an RFC. So that's, it's fairly simple, just read the RFC and, and figure out how that's, that text is supposed to look like. Um, what's, what you're going to see now is me cramming all the code to get this calendar working in one slide. So the people uh, who are not close to the screen might not be able to, to, to see what's going on. Uh, the first thing is, is the pattern matching for the, for the URL. So I have a, just created a URL, and, and uh, I, uh, return the, uh, I set the content type to text calendar, and I return a response string. Uh, the response string is generated by calling the vcal method, which takes a list of matches. So this is me in a very verbose, everything in one slide, uh, doing the calendar. Uh, of course, in my application, I've added some abstractions on top of this, so it doesn't look like, like this in, in my code. Uh, but it's just to show you everything in one slide. So <clears throat> I will do a fold over, the, over the, um, all the matches. So a fold is where you have a, st you have a starting point, which I declare first, which is the header. And the header is down there. That's just a header file for the, for the calendar. And I will fold all the matches on top of that header. So for every match, I'll create an event uh, as the event. I'll create an event uh, for, for all the matches, setting the, the, the duration and everything of the event. And finally, I'll add the footer. And if I, if I was to referee one match, uh, this is what it would look like, the, the response string. We all know who won this game, right? Um, this is the, if I take out the headers, this is the event. So it's, it's a fairly simple format to, to create, really, in, uh, uh, to get the calendar feed working. And this is my, an example of my calendar from uh, September of last year, uh, the matches I'm refereeing. So it shows you how I've imported that feed into Google Calendar, and it will automatically update. So that, in fact, concludes my presentation. And uh, as all referees, I'm, I'm open to question about my performance. Uh, so if, you're, if you have some questions about either the, the way I've used the technology, uh, some of the slides, loss of the game, handball, uh, I'll try my best to answer. Any questions?
Ah, so the question is, what was my considera considerations w with going for fern filtered? It's um, really was it was really simple. Uh, I had a colleague of mine who he w had already fell in love with and filtered, and he showed me some some code, and we were able to to get some code up on on, on Heroku in in like half an hour. Uh, so the way that it's very simplistic, uh, you you get some base support for for in the framework, but the rest you supply yourself. So you have, you're in full control, and it's, it's uh, really nice the way it handles HTTP. So it's, it's really true to the HTTP spec, if you will. Uh, you, you specify the HTTP status code, you can match on the status code, you can match on the, on, 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 on the uh, methods. Uh, so it's also really good if you want to do a REST API, where you can really be true to, to true REST and not RPC over, or JSON over RPC. Yeah, so the question is if I, if I considered scraping the whole site and, and, and uh, put it, sticking it in a database and use that as a, ca as a cache. Um, there's a couple of problems. The first one is that um, I'm not able to get to the data without users logging in. I need their credential to get their data. So I can't scrape the entire site. Uh, I could scrape once they're logged in and put, stick it in the database. Uh, but I don't want to be responsible for uh, referees not showing up to their game. So I went for, for like, uh, more recent up-to-date uh, data and, and, more, more, uh, uh, and a slower response time to, to, not, to make sure that I, I wasn't responsible. And I, I don't want to, m if, if I were to be responsible for a referee not showing up and he would to blame me, I'm sure someone would figure out a way to block my screen scraping. So I try to not make too, m too much of a fuss about my application. Any other questions? Okay, then, thanks for having me. Um, all, the, all the code examples from this, uh, these slides are on, uh, on my GitHub URL on the top there. I'll also provide a link to the slides uh, there later on, because I will upload them to some, some sort of slide sharing. Uh, the second link is for the actual source code of, the, of the, my application. So when, if you read that, please remember that this was my first attempt at Scala, so there might be some code there that's not really idiomatic Scala. My Twitter handle, if you have some questions. And finally, you can go to that uh, Heroku app URL, and you can try the different URLs in from the slides, and you will see the response, because this, this, uh, all the slides, or the code from the slide, is actually running on Heroku as we speak. OK, thanks.